I do worry that we as a country are not values-based in terms, for example, in caring about kindness, generosity, graciousness, and how we deal with each other. We are very much more concerned with kind of getting it over on the next person and not caring about our neighbor. For people of my parents' generation, and I think probably of your parents, would be appalled at some of what goes on in terms of the values at this stage. I think ironically that the pandemic, bringing everything to a screeching halt, may have helped many people to reconsider some of those things. Welcome to The Legacy Project. My name is Jim Koppel, president of the Servant Ford Foundation. We're an organization committed to leadership development with a specific focus on service. This podcast and its related activities are about sharing the legacy we have inherited and discussing the legacy we still want to create. Legacy is more than cars, houses, boats, and material possessions that we want to leave to the next generation. Rather, legacy is about core values and beliefs that we inherited from a previous generation. They are the values that shaped us and defined us. Legacy is also about the values we develop or create that can be passed on or shared with the next generation. We will interview people from various backgrounds and walks of life. Some are famous, some, well, maybe not so famous, and others are simply our neighbors, our friends, people who live ordinary lives doing extraordinary things. Become part of this project by being intentional about legacy. More than just memories, but principles that have guided our lives and shaped our decisions. What is the legacy you choose to create? That's what we want to discover. So we're talking with Lori Robinson, who is the Emeritus Professor, of Clarence J. Robinson Professor of Criminology, Law, and Society at George Mason University. I've realized, Lori, you may not have realized this, but I think I've known you for about 28 years. Uh, I was trying to remember the first time I met you. I was at CADCA, Community Anti-Drug Coalitions of America. And then uh, uh, we started working together on different projects off and on. And of course, our great collaboration with the President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing, where you served as co-chair and I helped facilitate uh, that meeting. uh, You you did far more than that, Jim. You you were a behind-the-scenes mastermind of the entire endeavor. <laughs> well, thank you for that. Uh, it was a, it was an exciting project. And probably for me anyway, it's probably the most significant project I've worked on in my career. It just was uh, uh, great to work with the, the, the task force members and continue to work with them on a couple of other projects. So, so Lori, where are you from? Where were you born? Where were you raised? Uh, I was born in Washington, D.C., a Washington native. Wow. Uh, which yeah. is actually kind of rare. When I tell people in Washington and they say, well, where are you actually from? And I say, I'm a, a Washington native. People are always surprised mm-hmm. and say, well, where are you really from? Yeah. <laughs> I was born right over there at George Washington Hospital. Though it was a prior a version of that hospital. Yes, Bill. Uh, and then my parents... Uh, Uh, moved out uh, to Northern Virginia, uh, and uh, I grew up in Falls Church, Mm -hmm. uh, so right outside, about uh, eight miles outside of uh, the city, Uh, and my father uh, worked uh, as a uh, lobbyist on Capitol Hill, Uh, so I, and my mother, uh, after we were mainly grown, worked at the uh, in the government at, at the Office of Economic Opportunity, OEO. So I grew up um, hearing about government uh, and about Congress around the dinner table all the time uh, and about politics. My mm-hmm. parents were very interested in politics. Uh, they had moved to Washington from North Dakota uh, where they had been uh, journalists. Mm-hmm. And my father came as part of the New Deal uh, uh, to work at the Department of Agriculture for the Rural Electrification Administration, REA, and then had moved over to the nonprofit association affiliated with the 
rural electric mm -hmm. cooperatives to be their head lobbyist. And so I kind of grew up imbued with talk of Congress, appropriations bills, <laughs> uh, government, and uh, I guess that's why it still is in my blood. Well, I guess. <laughs> so where did you go to school? Where did you do your undergraduate work? Uh, well, I uh, went to Brown University, mm -hmm. which uh, then within Brown had Pembroke College, though all of our classes were together and our degree was from Brown. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, ma Majored in political science. Yeah. So it truly was in your blood. You were sort of destined for this. Uh, yes, though I was actually quite disappointed with political science because it was so theoretical mm -hmm. uh, and took a lot of courses in sociology, did an independent study in that area because it was much more about policy, which I was really far more interested in than st statistical analyses. Well, it's not with any exaggeration to say that you've had a major influence on criminal justice reform, police reform. You've been an active leader in that space for a long time. What are some of the key influences in your life? What helps shape some of your values? Uh, what, what, what brings you into this space? Um, I mean, be proximity with your parents to be sure, but what else has kind of influenced? Well, I, I do need to go back and say that my parents were just substantial influences on me. Uh, my father, with his, not only his interest in government and his faith in government, and, uh, and my mother the same, that was so much a time uh, remembering the Kennedy administration. And by the way, I was a campfire girl as, yeah. a, as a child. And our campfire girl group had a chance to be ushers in Kennedy's inauguration. Oh, and wow. I had a chance to do that. And I remember, you know, there was a, you, Jim, you may remember there was an enormous blizzard that day. Yeah. Uh, and in the almost vacant stands, I remember waving to John and Jackie Kennedy as they went down uh, Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, we had faith in government at that yeah. time. Yeah. We had mm -hmm. faith that government could do good work. Mm -hmm. uh, and that stuck with me. Yeah. Uh, and my mother working in the original poverty program when it started, that Sergeant Shriver, yeah. uh, who, of course, was Kennedy's brother-in-law, started. Uh, so my parents' faith in the ability to make change through government uh, really was with me and my brother and sister. I have two siblings. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other legacy that they gave us was about writing and journalism. I told you that they had both been uh, journalists. They met on a newspaper in North Dakota. Uh -huh. um, my sister went on to do writing in a career uh, working for labor unions. Uh, and my brother was a reporter He's now retired uh, from NPR, huh. Peter, Peter Overby. I oh, yes. Yes. You uh, <laughs> that's your that, brother. That's... Yeah, that, that's my maiden name, Overby. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, so those two threads of uh, kind of interest in doing good public service mm -hmm. through government, um, hard work was part of that, hard work depending on, you know, having faith in your own capacity to contribute uh, and not being held back by the fact that my sister and I were not male. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so the confidence in your own ability to contribute. Uh, and uh, part of that as well, uh, uh, they were both, they had both lived through de the depression. Um, so I, I know one part of that was they were very frugal their whole lives, yeah. even when they had done fairly well. Uh, but in that, the sense of, of being, um, really wanting to contribute in a way, um, 
and caring for neighbors, being being generous, um, uh, being a community oriented. Uh, those were values that they passed on that I think we all grew up with. And another person who really influenced me when I was growing up and, and I think uh, contributed to my uh, strong belief in community, which goes to the criminal justice work, was the leader of my campfire girl group, hmm. a woman named Mrs. Hausman, uh, who was the mother of one of my close friends, who was with us all through the, the campfire years and only died just a few months ago. She was over a hundred years old. Uh, I, I went via Zoom to her memorial service just, uh, just about a month and a half ago. And uh, she was another Midwesterner from South Dakota mm -hmm. uh, and those same kind of values. And she really instilled those in us. Now, none of that had to do with my working in criminal justice per se, but the, but the values about caring for people, right. about caring about the, the importance of the humaneness of the system, mm -hmm. but also ensuring that the system works. Those are two important aspects of it uh, that I have cared about. You know, so the focus on people and that the system is responsive. I think those are two things that I really have felt strongly about. For example, when I went to the Office of Justice Programs in the Justice Department, uh, that we would want the, the agency to be responsive to the personnel within it, but also to the constituents that it was serving. Uh, but beyond that, that the bureaucracy actually had to function uh, in a real way that, that, that government has to work. Mm. And too often we don't see government and systems working. And by the way, leaping forward, Janet Reno was very much a mentor for mm. me when I did go in government. Yeah. Uh, and uh, one quick note that I would make there, uh, you, you may have during our uh, interaction when I was at the Justice Department, um, you may remember that Janet Reno regularly, sometimes on a daily basis, would have what she called her get back meetings. She had a list that I think at one time uh, totaled 800 items that she would follow her follow up list, basically, but it was called her get back list. She had things where she, a whole array of people within the department that she would tell to get back to me on what you're doing about, it could be the Southwest border, or it could be, what about the linings on the brake, the brake linings on DEA cars, because somebody on a trip had complained to her that they weren't working well. <laughs> and so she wanted follow up on that item. Yeah. But, but that, in some ways, it's a wonderful example. Yeah. And I started on the many trips that I took having my own get back list. Yeah. And Mike Gallich, my chief of staff, had to be the one doing but the follow up. <laughs> so Mike always carried a, a book with, with a pen to do his follow ups from our trips. But it's, a, it's an important thing for government to be able to yeah. be responsive to people you're serving yeah well uh, it's interesting Co one of colleen's favorite wow. memories is when she was running a comprehensive community program yeah. in salt lake city yeah i remember uh, well that's janet reno I yeah that's probably true uh janet reno came out to see her project and followed up with her on two things that she had discussed and colleen and ha she had a this great conversation mm -hmm. going back and forth and I, and I also remember when I was at the National Crime Prevention Council and we were doing the safe gun storage campaign yeah. and yeah. Uh, that she literally set in in the video reviews of the ads that were being <laughs> developed for that campaign. <laughs> I did, I wouldn't call it micromanagement. I called it micro caring. She just yes. had passion for uh, getting things done in an appropriate way. So, yeah. 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 And it was about caring. Yeah. But um that's why it's not that she told me to do this, but I love, I wanted to do what I saw her doing, which I thought 
mm-hmm. was terrific. Yeah. That's... I, I thought it was great. Well, those values, it's interesting, uh, Lori, uh, the, I met John Kennedy when I was 11 years old. Oh, gosh. He was, yeah. he was campaigning for president, and my grandmother was a local union leader. Oh, and my gosh. He got in the holding room before he was scheduled to speak and took me with him. And uh, she and he were in this discussion about organized labor. And he finally, <laughs> he turned and he looked down at me and he said, and Jimmy, what can I do for you? And I said, oh my God. I said, support labor. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, great. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, his, uh, his life, his values and what the optimism that yes. um, operated in that period had a great influence on me me as well. And um, so let me ask you this, Lori, in terms of the values that you've inherited from your parents, from your campfire director, and from just the environment in which you grew up in relationship to government. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things in this project, on the Legacy Project, uh, was that, well, I thought, well, am I just going to be talking to baby boomers? I'm actually talking to a lot of young people about the legacy they want to create. Yeah. And so in terms of your work, What's the legacy that you want to leave behind? What do you want people to think and say mm-hmm. about Lori Robinson uh, and the contribution that you've made? Uh, I think that there would be a, a couple of things. One is I would hope that they would remember that I had worked on the broad area of bringing science and evidence-based approaches uh, into criminal justice uh, and doing that, not just in the Department of Justice, which I think I did make an impact on, but advancing that nationally in criminal justice down to the state and local level. Uh, And secondly, uh, that I hope I also made an impact on advancing uh, the importance of putting people uh, front and center and the importance of humaneness Mm -hmm. uh, into the way that we are dealing with uh, crime and criminal justice. Uh, Because those, I think, are two central things, and particularly that that's the way that I dealt with my work, uh, both in how I approached policy, but also in how I approached management in what I did at the Department of Justice. How did you instill those kind of values in your teaching? Oh, um, well, from the standpoint of the evidence uh, approach, obviously, and substantively emphasizing that in in the work that I did uh, with the students in in both uh, lecture and uh, uh, the, the focus on the, the work that they did. But in terms of the, the people focus, uh, I was very involved uh, with really dealing with the students on a very um, engaged basis, I guess would be the way. Um, and uh, I also taught at Penn between, basically between the uh, Clinton and Obama administrations. And just as an example, I still probably hear from some of those students from one or or two of them every month. Uh, I really have stayed in touch with students after the classes because I care about these students and have worked with them, I, I, I'm a hard grader. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I don't mean that just in terms of the, the grades that I give. I, I expect a lot of students. I think I'm very compassionate toward them. And, but I, I want a lot of students. I want them to really dig down and, and draw on a lot of of their own skills and abilities uh, to engage with the class, which has been, of course, harder in the Zoom era. I've now taught 
two and a half Zoom classes or semesters rather. And uh, the importance of really calling on them uh, to really engage with material and come up with the best that they can uh, to make something of it. I'm not a traditional academic. I think, uh, I, I, ha I don't wanna boast, but I got, always got really very high student evaluations. And I think one reason is because I'm not a traditional academic. I was always extraordinarily candid with them. If I thought uh, some approach was stupid, I always <laughs> told them that. Uh, I was very straightforward with them about my views on things, uh, uh, on uh, criminal justice policies or whatever. And I think that, that uh, having a, an honest relationship, whether it's with uh, personnel at the Justice Department who work for you or with students, is the best way to form a candid and, and honest relationship and that you get a, a good relationship going then. Yeah. Um, uh, I talked with them candidly about this past semester, for example, uh, or in the fall, I guess, with my undergraduates about the difficulties I had uh, as a young woman in the criminal justice world. Um, and uh, a number of the students commented at the end of the semester that they really appreciated that. So just, talking to them in an open way and then saying, uh, uh, offering to give, I uh, give them advice at the end of the semester about what it takes to really succeed out after uh, they graduate. Because I find that nobody in college really talks to them about how to uh, behave in the working world. Uh, the importance of, sending thank you notes, just the most simple kind of things. And so many students say, say to me, nobody's ever given us practical advice like that. Mm. So I try to do those kinds of things. Um, but the, the important thing I think uh, is also uh, to be candid to them about the importance of, of hard work and not giving up. I always say to the students that th their mothers told them not to be stubborn, but in fact, the perseverance, which is a nicer term than stubbornness. <laughs> yeah. um, perseverance is really an important thing. And I think a lot of the students in this generation uh, give up too easily. They expect if they don't like a job, they'll just quit and get another one. But they need to find what their passion is and pursue it. Uh, and they can't give up if things are a little rough. They need to really stick with it. So I give them a lot of advice along that line. Yeah, yeah that's important. We're talking with Lori Robinson, who is uh, the Emeritus Clarence J. Robinson Professor of Criminology, Law and Society at George Mason and so much more in terms of her leadership and former uh, Assistant Attorney General uh, during the Clinton administration and Obama administration. Um, Lori, one of the memories I have of you and um, is, and why I've always just really valued this aspect of the contribution you make to people's lives. After I was uh, unceremoniously fired from CADCA, Community Anti-Drug Coalitions of America, and before I went to the National Crime Prevention Council, you picked up the phone and called me and you said, Jim, are you okay? Oh. And uh, you then said, do you need anything? Do you need work? <laughs> and I said, I'm going to be fine. And then a couple of weeks later, you called and asked me to serve on a, a group that you were putting together to look at the relationship of alcohol to crime. Oh, yes. And mm -hmm. um, you kind of threw me back into the water. <laughs> and uh, uh, that always meant a lot to me. And uh, that was a, a, something, a, a piece of, you, of who you are, the legacy that you've created, that kind of empathy, that kind of caring uh, is always something I think about when I think of Lori Robinson. You know, and uh, I, my guess is your other students, your students also see that in you. Well, that's very, 
Yeah. Nice. I, I, I remember, um, I, I had forgotten what had happened with Kadka, yeah. but I do remember asking you to be on the, the alcohol, group, yeah. which was yeah. a, uh, something that Marlene Beckman and I put together. Uh, yep. Remember Marlene? Yep, I sure do. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and um, was something I was very, very interested in on the alcohol and, and connection with crime. Um, and I was delighted that you were willing to help on that yeah, because yeah. of your your history and your background yeah. of expertise in that area uh, of the whole area of uh, substance yeah. abuse. Yeah. And so uh, do I have this right or wrong? You worked at the American Bar Association for a while, yes. right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I worked there for close to 20 years. Really? Yeah. That long? Because mm -hmm. I think my first encounter with you was when I was at CADCA and uh, I forget the president of the ABA who was from Atlanta. Oh, Bill Ide. Yeah, Bill Ide. Absolutely. Yeah, he was very interested in those issues. Yeah, he was. And um, uh, it was, uh, I had just moved there from the Midwest and it was a complete whole reorientation to a different power structure. Yeah. And um, it was, uh, 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 that was my first encounter with you. Let me ask you this, um, in terms of the values and the legacy that you have, and uh, the role of your parents. And, and, and this is a bit of an awkward question. I don't know if we've ever seen the romantic comedy Leap Year. Uh, it's a movie uh, where uh, a woman goes to Ireland and she asks a man to marry him. But anyway, he asks her in terms of her values. He said, if your house was on fire and you could grab one thing, not beyond your husband, your ch any children or pets or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But if you could grab one thing, what would you grab in your house um, that symbolizes who you are and where you came from? Oh, it would very much be um, a photo album mm -hmm. of uh, that includes pictures from uh, when uh, I was growing up with my parents. Mm -hmm. That would be the thing you would grab. And, and yeah. what, what would that photo ab album tell you? Oh, it would tell me uh, about, it's hard for me to talk about, mm -hmm. uh, about, um, about my parents and, and, and my sister and brother, who, who are both uh, I still see and love dearly. And th they both live in Washington area and but of course my parents are gone uh, and it's just part of uh, who you are yeah 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 and uh, for, for whatever reason I have a very uh, good memory I remember a lot of things from when I was two and three mm. uh, and I know those dates my sister and I often talk about this because of remembering when we moved between two different houses and, and such. And so I have vivid memories from all of those times, but, but the photos are just very representative of that, mm -hmm. uh, are, are yeah. just a, a wonderful memory of it all. Yeah. So the, uh, in terms of, uh, the imprint that you've had on uh, criminal justice reform, police reform, so many areas in the Department of Justice, and the kind of values you talked about in terms of the, I like the phrase, if I'm not saying this right, the humanness of government, uh, or that the humanity is yeah. something that is important. Are we losing that in our culture? Or uh, are you hopeful? Or are you? Uh, well, one of the things, Jim, that I I always say is you have to be an optimist to work in criminal justice. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've, said that, I've, I've said that to many a reporter. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so yes, I, I am, I guess I would say the, the, the usual term is cautiously optimistic. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one reason I'm, optimistic is I do see in a lot of the, the young people, my, my students age, um, kind of the generation Z, I guess they call them, um, uh, a desire 
to make things more humane. Mm -hmm. And uh, that with technology, while there is a potential to make things less humane, there's also a potential to connect people. So, um, and also a, a, a potential to make government work better as we're thinking about humanity in terms of government process and making the criminal justice system, for example, function more effectively. Um, so there is the potential, there has to be the will, however, and that's the missing uh, ingredient in the question mark here. Uh, I think there, there certainly is the, the capacity, but there has to be the will to drive that forward. So, and this is getting close to my last question, but now I'm going to follow up on this. Uh, uh, that the will, I've often said in this country, it's seldom about resources; it's about will. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, well, I'm I'm in agreement on that. Yeah, you know, we we generally try to solve the problems uh, that, uh, and we do solve the problems we choose to solve, it seems. But in terms of creating that will. Um, what kind of comment would you make about the values operating in our current culture that either shapes that will or, or runs over people? I mean, I mean, I watch the daily news. I am encountering people and I wonder where does that come from or that kind of inhumanity uh, come from? I come from a fairly conservative faith tradition. I'm probably the most progressive in that faith tradition. But I, you know, I see posts on Facebook. I see books or I'm reading books about stuff. And I just go, where does this come from? Are you concerned that we're losing value-based um, motives in the way we operate or we work? Yes, yes, I am. Uh -huh. uh, I, uh, I am very progressive, generally, certainly in my politics. But I do worry that we, as a country... Uh, are not values-based in terms, for example, in caring about uh, kindness, generosity, graciousness in how we deal with each other. We are very much more concerned with uh, kind of getting it over on the next person uh, uh, and not uh, caring about our neighbor. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think ironically that the uh, pandemic, by bringing everything to a screeching halt, uh, may have ironically helped many people to reconsider some of yeah. these things. Uh, and by the way, I think that for people of my parents' generation, and I think probably of your parents, would be appalled at some of what goes on. Uh, in terms of the values at this stage. But uh, I, I do not think that social media has contributed in any way positively uh, to the continuation of good values. Yeah. Uh, I think I, I don't participate in social media uh, to any large extent. But my sense of it is that it degrades mm -hmm. our values yeah. and is not a positive in any way. And the impact on young people, particularly very young people in their teens and preteens, uh, cannot in any way be a good impact on our culture from my, my sense. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I I facilitate once a quarter a, a book club. It's called Leading to Serve, and uh, it's a divi diverse groups and foundation presidents and political leaders from across the country. And uh, we just finished reading and had a discussion with the author. Uh, I don't know if you know Robert Livingston at the Kennedy School. Uh, I know of him. I don't know. Yeah, him. he um, just came out with a book called The Conversation which deals with race oh. and racism. Yeah, I read about it. Yeah, it's a powerful book. Uh, but one of the points that he makes in this is that social media has just put everything into shorthand. I mean, you don't, 
yeah. you can't have a sustained conversation. You can't follow up. Um, and uh, uh, that's one of the reasons that this, uh, in fact, when we first started the podcast, I was sort of under the influence that these are, should be five or 10 minute podcasts. But uh, several consultants that I worked with on developing this said, no, the longer conversations is what's needed in the culture, um, mm -hmm. that we're not just uh, uh, cutting things off so short in that process. Um, well, Lori, thank you for your time. This has been extremely rich. Uh, you've had an amazing influence um, in a variety of areas. And it, and and. The one thing I take away from this is, uh, uh, is the word caring. Your parents were caring. They taught you how to care. Campfire leader taught you how to care mm -hmm. and compassion. Um, oh, just one other little quick sidebar. I, I was a camping skills instructor for Campfire Girls. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yes. And I, took, and I lived in Missouri, and we went on trips to North Dakota. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's a very small world. It is. <laughs> very small world. Well, do, camp well, do campfire girls still exist? Yeah, I, I think still, they do. They do. Yeah. That's something. Well, yeah. that's great. That kind of community and that kind of uh, mentoring is, is really important. Oh, yeah. Well, it was very, very important in my growing up. Yeah. Well, Jim, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, it, this has been a, a delightful conversation, and I appreciate, again, the invitation. To find out more information about this conversation and other Legacy Podcast episodes, go to ServantForge.org. Please subscribe to us on your favorite podcast app and consider leaving us a review. We want to hear from you. We want to get your ideas and your opinions. I have a new book that corresponds with a Legacy Project titled The Seeker, Bring Me the Horizon. You can find a copy of it on Amazon or your preferred book distributor. The book corresponds closely with these podcasts. The podcast episode was produced by Matt Erickson and edited by Carissa Erickson. The music is by David Hyde. Please look for a new episode of our podcast coming out soon. Remember, you have inherited a great legacy. You have an opportunity to create a great legacy. Engage your past to build a future.